we're going to go ahead and get started. I know there's still some folks coming, and I'm sure we'll have a few more, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Marius Johnson Malone. I'm the Deputy Director of Community-Based Studies for Better Together. Uh, I know that you have a lot of other places you could be this evening, and uh, you chose to spend it here with us learning about this proposal. And so I'm, I'm very appreciative of you taking the time as citizens to come out and learn, hear about this proposal. Um, I also want to take a, a moment to thank uh, very sincerely our hosts this evening, Reverend Tommy Pearson and the church here at Greater St. Mark Family Church. Um, they've been very gracious to us. We give them a round of applause. In particular, because when we originally booked the event here, uh, it was going to be in a different room, but as the capacity continued to grow, he allowed us to to have this event in the sanctuary, and we're extremely grateful to them. They're always very accommodating for uh, the community when they're having events, so keep them in mind if you have an event of your own. Um, so I just want to give you a brief overview of what we're going to be going, what's going to be going on this evening. I'm going to spend a few minutes going through uh, some of the pieces of the plan that some of you, I, that I know you've all heard about, otherwise you wouldn't be here. I want to spend some time talking about how we got to where we are, what our issues here in St. Louis are that prompted this discussion, and then um, lay out the pieces of the plan and how it, we anticipate that working. After that, uh, we want to spend some time with you all really going through how uh, some questions that you have and concerns. I'll talk a little bit more about that piece when we get to it, but we want to keep it structured so that we have as many opportunities to hear from folks in the audience. There were some folks who also submitted questions ahead of time, uh, and we will intersperse those that questions with the questions from the audience so that we can make sure we're getting everyone's uh, answers out there. And then we'll talk at the end a little bit about if you have additional questions uh, and, and what we can do uh, to engage further on this work. So with that, we'll get started. So I want to just start with understanding what are our problems here in the region. Um, we know that we have some issues in St. Louis, and, and I think that's a really important place to start because it, 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 this conversation doesn't make any sense at all if we don't start from a place of understanding and uh, having some commonality of, under, of what is going on and what this is coming from, that this doesn't come out of a vacuum. So first of all, we know that what we have as far as local government in St. Louis is, is expensive. We spend $2.5 billion annually on local government services in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. That encompasses the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County itself, uh, the 90, or the 88, excuse me, municipalities in St. Louis County and the 23 fire districts. So often when we would cite this statistic when we first started, people wondered, is that a lot? It sounds like a lot of money, but I don't have any context for that. So what we did is we looked to other regions to see what they were spending on similar services. We did our best to compare and make sure that we were matching up and. And what we found is that on a per capita basis, we spend over $750 million annually, more than our neighbors in Indianapolis, and almost a billion dollars more than our neighbors in Louisville. Uh, so that's really uh, problematic as a, as a starting point. We also know that even with all of that money being spent in this system, the services that we get are not really uh, distributed equitably, equitably across this region. So in some communities, you have everything that you might want from your local government, whether that be a really professional police department, um, street cleaning, all those things. In other areas, we struggle to have an adequate level of those base public services that you should be getting from your local government, like policing and, and, and other things. Further, we have this system, because we have so many different governmental units with no overarching um, sense of, of who we are as a region, we have this competition among our governments. We know that we all compete uh, with each other, with our neighbors over retail dollars. I think there's been some high profile examples of that kind of thing happening in the news lately. But we also um, really have a skewed vision of what success looks like in this space. So rather than thinking about how can we grow St. Louis, we're foc often focused on how can we grow my part of St. Louis. And sometimes that comes at the expense of what's happening in a neighboring community. There have been some studies by other organizations like East West Gateway that have quantified some of that work, and we know that the use of tax incentives is really key to that, um, particularly that we have a very little oversight of how those things are being done on a regional basis. Amidst all of this, we have continue to lose population in this region. So St. Louis City, I think most people are familiar that the city has lost population for multiple decades now. 
in the last census, St. Louis County for the first time in its history lost population and the most recent census estimates show that that, is going, that trend is gonna continue in the next census. Um, so essentially we are paying more money for the same services for fewer people. We also recognize that right now, because of our structure, we have no ability to have a collective impact as a region. So the mayor doesn't answer to the county executive or vice versa. None of the municipal mayors are, from a legal standpoint, responsive to the county executive. They all derive their power from the state, uh, which means that when we want to say, we wanna pursue an opportunity in this region, whether that is an economic development opportunity or focusing our resources on job growth, or that means addressing some of our region's biggest issues, whether that uh, around health disparities, around public safety, uh, we know that we don't have a single voice that can say this is who we want to be in the region. We don't have even the mechanism to do that. We have to muster our resources. And sometimes we have success in that in pockets around the region, which is really encouraging. But I think we recognize that the magnitude of our problems deserve something that uh, a little bit stronger on that front. And lastly, we continue to see growth in taxes and spending. When we started our work in 2013, that 2.5 billion figure that I told you was 2.3 billion. In three short years, we saw that figure grow by $120 million. And that was largely from over 130 tax increases in St. Louis City and County since um, April 2012. Sorry, I wanted to make sure I get that timing right for you. But we're, I think uh, in the next coming months, we could be at over 150 local tax increases in the St. Louis City and County region from those governments that I mentioned. It's really unsustainable for us as a region, and I think we need to do something to address these large-scale problems that we have locally. So essentially, when you put all this together, we have a system that really wasn't set up to succeed. We have this system that I think if anyone challenged you to say on a map, draw St. Louis, the ideal St. Louis, almost no one would come up with what we have today. It's come up organically over time. Some communities are a couple of centuries old, some are just a couple of decades old. Uh, there was a real boom in the housing and communities that have come to be after the Second World War and suburbanization trends that we saw uh, nationally, but those were really exacerbated in St. Louis because of the way how easy it was to incorporate. In some instances, those the motivation for some of those communities was born out of uh, desire to exclude certain populations. And so what we have today is we're living with the results of no planning over the course of the last 150 years in this region. Our organization was formed in 2013, and it was really born out of an interest from some civic leaders to really see how can we address the, this fragmentation of St. Louis. We knew that we had a lot of governments. We knew St. Louis City was separate from St. Louis County, which is fairly unusual. Um, the only other major city in the country that has that situation is Baltimore, uh, with Baltimore County. And so there was a, an interest in addressing that. And what they found was, very, they very quickly found, was there was little to no information to inform any kind of decision about what might make sense for the future. You couldn't at that time go to anywhere to see what the budgets of all the governments in the region were. Uh, they weren't housed online, even at the state level. You couldn't understand how many government uh, there were. Even understanding the number of municipal courts, you could go to the state court's website, and that wasn't an accurate representation either. And so they set up our organization to understand, to say, let's study these local governments and just see what we have. So we set out studying six different areas of local government, starting with public finance, economic development, public health, public safety, parks and recreation, and general administration. Just to say, what is the status quo? How do we currently deliver services in this area right now? How are best practices, what are best practices nationally? And how do we as a region stack up to those best practices? So we went through that work for uh, about three and a half years. And then in 2016, I think we were even surprised by the depth of issues around this work, particularly after uh, Michael Brown was shot and killed in 2014, it became apparent that not all of the systems that these governments had were benign. So the impact that people were having, the impact on people's lives, excuse me, was disproportionate to uh, certain populations in this region, particularly when it came to municipal courts and the policing. Uh, we saw that certain communities were being overly policed in, and harassed in ways that um, 
changed their lives forever, affected their employment, their housing, and, and that this system was no longer going to work for St. Louis. And so we needed to confront those issues head on. So at the end of that process, we took a step back and decided to say, how can we, what can we do with this? We have all of this data, we have all this information. We spent a lot of time engaging the community in that. In each one of those study areas, we had members of the community serve on committees for that study area. We hosted public events. Uh, so for economic development, for instance, we had town halls and, and meetings with small business owners to understand what was their experience with these local governments. It's one thing to have the numbers on paper, but what was the experience of the people that lived in these communities and dealt with these governments on a daily basis? Um, that was our approach, and you may have heard, again, my title is Deputy Director of Community-Based Studies. We really were committed from the beginning uh, in involving the community in this process. So we got to the end of our, our initial studies, and I, like I said, we had this set of data, both from the governments themselves, but also from the people were interacting with these governments on a daily basis, and we needed to figure out what was next. We knew that we needed some solutions for this St. Louis region, but we wanted to have a fresh perspective. And so we asked a few citizens in the region to lead a task force that had, they had experiences in different parts of uh, the community and different connections to different pieces of the community. And we asked them to lead a process that we staff. Those individuals uh, really took their tasks seriously as far as involving the community and understanding what are the things people value about what we have today what are the things that they would like to see differently? And what are the service areas that they would like to have uh, impacted in a different way in our region? From that process, they also recognized that this opportunity was greater than just the recommendations of Better Together uh, that we had done. We'd had, at that point, uh, a really monumental study and that engaged the community around the Ferguson Commission report. We also knew we had uh, other resources like For the Sake of All report on health disparities in St. Louis, uh, in the St. Louis region that highlighted that life expectancy between some black residents in parts of St. Louis and white residents just a few miles away differed by up to 18 years. And when we talked to public health professionals and we talked to people in that space that understood that it wasn't just the health outcomes that uh, the things that we traditionally think about as contributing to your health, you know, the things you eat, your exercise, those kinds of things, but also a built environment, housing and education, those kinds of things that affected health. We recognized that this was a critical opportunity and the, local the role local governments play in people's lives can have a positive impact in reducing those health disparities and those outcomes for life. So the task force went about their work. They set out to hold, uh, they had eight public town halls, one of which was here in this building, where they, again, they were asking for input on people's values for the local governments. They also did best practice research, uh, traveled to other cities to learn what lessons could, could we learn from other people's experience who've traveled down this road before. We know that any solution had to be unique to St. Louis, but we understood that we weren't the first ones to do this and wanted to make sure that we avoided their mistakes, but also took in their best opportunities and things that they uh, knew worked for them. Uh, so with that, they came up with a set of recommendations that reflected four principles that really emerged from that work in engaging the community. Number one, folks said that they wanted to see a unified voice on economic development in this region. Uh, they wanted to see a stop to some of the fighting, the infighting, and all those things. Two, they wanted to see unified uh, public safety, because regardless of where they live, people, even people that lived in communities that have really great service in policing or Municipal courts recognized the injustice that they'd seen on TV or read in the newspapers and wanted to make sure that there was a standard for uh, public safety in every area of this, this region. Third, they wanted to see more efficient use of tax dollars. You know, we had been saying that there was overspend. Well, where's that money and how do we make sure that, that our tax dollars are being used responsibly? And fourth and finally, uh, we heard really loudly and clearly that people wanted to see the maintenance of their cultural identities in their communities. They didn't want to have what uh, they have in some places uh, where all the municipalities were eliminated and they have uh, what is called a unigov. They really valued the local identity of their communities and that was all across this region. Whether you live in the city of St. Louis County, or the city of St. Louis, excuse me, here in North St. Louis County, in West County, South County, that was something we heard across the region. So with that, uh, we're gonna play a short video just summarizing the recommendations that you've probably heard about and, and where uh, the task force landed with this feedback. 
A St. Louis Metro City would unite the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County into one Metro City, creating a new government to replace what is currently two county governments. We would have one Metro City government with a Metro Mayor and a 33 member Metro Council. A united voice to address regional economic planning and development, better equipping us to create jobs for the people who live here and the people who want to live here. Consolidated human services, allowing us to better address the health, housing, economic, and safety needs of residents. One professional police department, municipal court, and Metro City prosecutor, uniting efforts to address public safety and eliminating waste that harms our community preserving the neighborhood and municipal identities that many of us grew up with. So that's just a broad strokes overview of the uh, <clears throat> recommendations from the task force and what the amendment that's been submitted to the Secretary of State uh, reflects. So hopefully in your, on your way in, you received a brochure that goes through some of those pieces as well. I don't wanna belabor the point for those if, uh, of you. Um, on what the structure is. I think that's the piece that folks have heard the most about in the news. Um, but I do want to look, talk just really briefly about what the process looks like if, if uh, this goes forward. So in November of 2020, there will be a constitutional amendment. So let me back up, actually, because <clears throat> I think that's an important point. One of the things we recognized, as the task force recognized, was that the problems we have in St. St. Louis are unique. We are starting from a different place than any of the other governments started. The relationship between the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County is in the Constitution. Uh, we have more governments than they do, and that they, than they started with, and so the solutions needed to be unique, particularly in trying to bring together the police departments and the municipal courts uh, and while preserving municipal identities. That was a real challenge for us to figure out how that could be done. And so thinking outside the box, uh, it was recommended that the best way to do it would be to create a new form of government for the state of Missouri. This is gonna look like what I think a lot of other regions look like, but in Missouri, there's not currently a way to do what is recommended, and so that required an amendment to the Constitution. So with that, there would be a vote in November of 2020. If that vote is successful, uh, that would begin on January 1st of 2023, or 2021, excuse me, a two-year process of transition where the heads of the two counties, the mayor of the city of St. Louis and the county executive in St. Louis County would lead that transition effort. During that time, they would do a few things. They would, um, there would be lines drawn by an independent nonpartisan expert to come up with the council districts for the 33 uh, member council to be voted on in November of 2022. There would be a reorganization plan that they would be developing to understand how those executive functions, how the departments are organized, and what those would look like. Um, there's a really public process, and that's in the amendment as well, that there has to be some public input on that. And then that reorganization plan would have to ultimately be approved by the Metro Council of the new government. In November 2022, there's the first election of the Metro Council, and they would take office in January of 2023. Uh, the first Metro mayor, uh, prosecutor, and assessor would then have be elected in November of 2024, and so the full transition would be complete at that time. With that, yep, I think we are ready for questions. I know that was a lot of information in a short time, but I also recognize that you all have things that you hope to learn tonight, and I want to be able to get to those. So what we're going to do for the question segment is there's two microphones in the room. If we could... If you have a question, feel free to come to the line. As I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> we want to make sure we get to as many people as possible. So I'm asking you folks to limit their question to a maximum of two minutes. We're gonna be equitable in that uh, so that everyone has the opportunity to be heard. We also, like I mentioned before, had some questions from folks ahead of time. So as we're getting to the line, let's start with the questions from, start with one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time. Question comes from U City. Your policing recommendation states that a merged police department will create greater equity. Both St. Louis City and county departments are twice as likely to stop black people as they are white people. Current practices in both departments results in inequitable outcomes for African Americans now. What evidence do you have that combining the two would somehow create equity? Thank you for that question. Um, so I think 
there's a couple things there. One, I, we are not of the opinion that what we have in either of, or in any of the departments is ideal, particularly on that statistic that was listed. I think that's probably from the Attorney General's office around disparity in policing and the results of people being pulled over. Um, but it's also important to note that right now we have a network of police departments, of 55 police departments in this region that doesn't allow us to effectively even pursue reform in the way that I think most of us would think is appropriate. So if we're thinking about that statistic, and let's say that we got went out and we were able to get the city of St. Louis or St. Louis County Department to uh, change their behavior in a way that was really successful and, and reduce that disparity of the impact uh, between African Americans and, and white St. Louisans in, St. Louis, in the region, we would still have to go and have that same kind of reform effort in 54 other departments. And so that is not really a model of success because we know reform is hard. We know it's difficult to advocate as a community for the things we want from our local governments. It shouldn't be this hard, particularly on issues that important. And so we feel strongly that not only will bringing together those 55 departments allow us as a community to have a base level standard across all parts of this region for what it means to be a police department, but any efforts at reform are made that much easier because we're able to address them towards a single entity rather than the landscape we have today. With that, we'll go to, if you would please state your name and. Hello, my name is Dr. Miranda Von Elliott. I am an older woman in Bell Fountain and I'm also an educator. So my concern is around um, education being a part of the discussion. If you're talking about economic development, how is that not a part of the reform and the restructure? And in addition to that, my question is with mayors in the county having a longer year of services to the community, being a veteran mayor, how was it that structure decided that the mayor of the city and the prosecutor or whoever will be the, the main individuals at this time instead of looking at other mayors in, in the county? So I think I hear two questions there. Okay, so the first question is about why education. was education not a part of this? So when we set out to do this work, uh, when our or organization was founded, it was focused on local governments uh, at the municipal service level. And that decision was made because you, for a number of reasons that are, are a little bit above my pay grade, but the essential reason is because you wanted to start with something. Um, and that was the focus. And so that's what we started doing our work in and doing the research in. We've heard from people for a long time that they wanted to address education in some way, shape, or form, but we have not had the capacity. We had, uh, at one point, the Ferguson Commission did call for, in fact, uh, a task force to look at educational structure and funding in the region. Because even through their process that I think most would agree did a really great job of getting people from the community involved uh, at every level, they came away thinking, we don't know what the right answer is. And so this needs its own effort. That's sort of the practical answer. The legal answer is also that if we were interested in doing education, first of all, we would have to bring on uh, folks that have some expertise in that, in that area to be able to do it well, to understand what the right solutions look like. Um, but it would also have to take its own separate effort. Education and local governments, whether it makes sense or not, are two separate political subdivisions and the way that they're laid out from a legal perspective is there are different parts of the Constitution. So even if we had done the work around education and, and had really a great solution crafted that we could put out there as, as we feel we do on this, uh, it would have to take two separate efforts and, and just from a practicality standpoint, we don't have the resources to be able to do that. So that's your first question. The second question is uh, how were the individuals chosen as, as far as to, to lead that transition period, is that correct? Okay, so that piece, it, it comes down to a couple things. Number one, it made the most sense in thinking about how do we get from A to B to have the heads of the two biggest governments coming together, the city and the county, be the leaders in that effort. Uh, just from a structural standpoint, they were the folks who were elected by the most people in the region, and so that was, that was um, the, the starting point for the thinking there. The second part was, in that transition period, we wanted to ensure, first and foremost, that stability was something that could be achieved. So, you know, you're gonna go start on day one with a system and you wanna make sure that 
the services that exist today can continue on day one and there's a structure in place to make sure that people are still getting their trash picked up and getting the police service and the things that they rely on on a day-to-day -day basis. And so minimizing disruption around that was really important. Um, having a political campaign going on in the background of trying to stand up a new government uh, to us seemed not really feasible. And as we looked to other regions to see how did they handle the situation, one of the things that they did was extending the term of one of the currently elected officials for a time to make sure that we could have a, a successful transition and economic activity can continue, services can continue as we transition from where we were, where we are today to where we hope to be at the end of that process. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> he told me you have to get a drink. <laughs> My name is Yolanda Fountain Henderson. I am the board president of Virginia School District. Uh, she kind of, kind of uh, asked that particular question. Um, my thing is, uh, how did you arrive at 33 uh, elected councils? And um, another thing is, why are the people in the rural area able to vote on this particular situation when it's not going to affect them? Okay. So I'll take your first question first, and then I'll come to the second one. Uh, 33, uh, sort of an odd number if you if you coming to it out of nowhere. So I think that's a thank you for that. Um, one of the things we recognized, we looked at the landscape of how many elected officials we have right now. We looked at other cities to see about what their council size was, what the district's size was for those, uh, and tried to achieve a legislative body that could do uh, a few things that were really important to be successful. Number one, have uh, a district size that was large enough, that was small enough to, um, so that people could still feel a connection to their elected representative. That was something that we heard through community input that was really important to people. We know that particularly where the municipalities are now, they will still have, the municipal districts will still have their mayor and other things, but because these services are coming from so many services will not be coming from the metro city. We wanted people to have that accessibility. Uh, the other piece that's important was in thinking about how uh, representation shakes out in these governments and being able to elect a body that has, um, that's, whose demographics have a chance of mirroring that of the population. So making sure that there are enough minority folks, enough uh, Democrats or Republicans, all those things that matter. And a larger legislative body lent itself to that. Um, with a smaller body, it becomes harder to make sure that, that, that those things are matching up in the way that you would want in a representative democracy. And so thinking about those things, 33 member body gets you to about 39,000 folks in a legislative district or in a metro council district. And so that is very similar to what we have for a state house district. So that was the, some of the thoughts that went into that. Your second question, why the statewide vote? Um, you know, I, I think from our perspective, we know that it's it's not ideal, and I think people recognize that <laughs> based on your round of applause. But when right. we looked at the reality of how do we put forth a government that is representative of what we heard people wanting from uh, their government and what was available to us as in the state of Missouri to how to get there based on where we are today being split between that split between the city and the county being in the constitution and getting to a place where we can have that combined public safety function while maintaining those sense of community, the only pathway was through a constitutional amendment which requires a statewide vote. All right, thank you. We'll take this question, we'll do one more from the pre-submitted questions after this. Good evening, my name is Carol Strawbridge. I'm a Ferguson resident retired elementary school principal for 14 years, thank goodness. I'm going to read some information from uh, NPR. I don't know if some people got this or not. <clears throat> the statement is, during a two year transition period, people will file in 2022 to run for the 33 council districts. Some of the newly elected council members will serve two year terms while others will serve four year terms. My question is, what guidelines are gonna be used to determine who will do the two year terms, who will do the four year terms? So that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, 
I think likely what's going to happen is the two-year terms for that. So first of all, all council members will be serving four terms eventually. Uh, the first round of council members for that are elected in 2022, half of them need to serve a two-year term so that you can have staggered elections. Every two years, half of the council can be elected. Uh, and so in order to do that, the first round of some of them. So what will likely happen is the even district or the even numbered districts for that uh, November 2022 term will be serving for a two-year term initially, and then we'll run again in 2024 for their full four-year full term. Uh, the even number district, because there will be one less of those than the odd number districts. Okay. The next statement, um, Thursday, to begin the process, creating a board of freeholders. This was part of this. It was stated that Mayor Lyda Cruson, County Executive Steve Stinger, and Governor Mike Parsons will appoint 19 people to study a potential merger other than evidently what this is. My question is, with all studies, they can go from one day to 100 years. Now, how long is this study going to take? Do you have an idea? Um, so that process, the Board of Freeholders process that you're describing there is laid out in the Constitution uh, of Missouri. And I think by that process, they actually have a maximum of one year to submit their, their um, recommendations or no recommendation at all. And this will be before 2020 or? No that depends that. on when the, so the process, very briefly, the Board of Freeholders process uh, is initiated by a collection of signatures of 3% of the registered voters in the city and 3% of the registered voters in St. Louis County. Once those collectors, those signatures are collected and certified, then that uh, prompts the process of the mayor of St. Louis appointing nine individuals, the county executive appointing nine individuals, and the governor appointing one, someone from outside the St. Louis region. And those are the individuals that you referred to who will make up the board of freeholders. Those individuals have to be approved by the county council and the board of aldermen respectively um, to and then once all of that is done, they, are, they will then go on to begin their process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna take one question qu real quickly from one of the pre-submitted questions. This question comes from Riverview. Kim Gardner has a list of 20 something officers that she refuses to even review their reports. How would that affect those officers when they're assigned throughout St. Louis County? Will the new prosecutor place them off his hit list also and not even consider reviewing their reports or will they all be fired and not even have a job so that question is actually one of administrative uh and, and so essentially this process does not affect that at all uh the circuit attorney's office uh, made that decision and so that would be up to whoever the new metro prosecutor is that's the decision that would be left there um this would not enshrine that or uh, automatically get rid of that that would have to be worked out in the transition between two folks merging those offices. Yes, sir. Hi, sir. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about something that you just brought up that isn't ideal, as you said, that this could happen even if the people in the county and the city voted against it. And that seems like a really striking risk to take, that you could create a government that literally doesn't have the support of the government. And um, there's been the talk that it has to be a constitutional amendment, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there couldn't be a vote. Um, Real quick, I'll list the ways I thought of that there could be a vote. The first way is the freeholder approach that you just talked about. It's in the Constitution. It does require a vote and public meetings. The next way would be a referendum in the county and the city that you as better together would pledge to, to recognize before you went forward. That would result in a vote. The third is something I think is already happening that some representatives are suggesting from, from the state house either to have a constitutional amendment or something that requires any change like this. Uh, could only happen if everyone supported it. Number four is you could make a small change to your already complex constitutional amendment that simply said, none of the rest of this happens unless the people in the county and the city uh, vote for it. Um, and the last would be simply to break your process into two. If you really do need a constitutional amendment, pass a constitutional amendment that says, this is what we want, but that requires a separate vote. I know I went through those real quick, but the point is, the thing you described is not ideal can be fixed and i think that if better together put your uh, resources and your creativity towards finding a way to make sure that this government is legitimate you could do it so i wanted to ask if you reconsider and find a way for there to be a vote so um 
I will tell you that we explored uh, a number of those things that you just mentioned there. Um, the Board of Freeholders we explored extensively because it is the process that's in the Constitution. The problem with that is twofold. One, uh, primarily because of the, the um, desire to combine the public safety functions, particularly the police and the courts, the Board of Freeholders is problematic there. Because the Board of Freeholders is a process within the Constitution, but anything that comes out of the Board of Freeholders does not trump what is considered what's called the general law in the state of Missouri. So this is very technical. A general law, there is a general law in the state of Missouri that says if you are a municipality of 400 or more people, you must provide police protection. And so there's no way to get to the consolidation of the police or the courts, which are in a different part of the Constitution, but are related to the municipalities in an, in an odd way. Um, you couldn't get at those two things through the Board of Freeholders with anything that could be successful. So that's the first one. The second, two of your suggestions, one through the legislature and one through changing the amendment, are ways that would essentially say, you know, this only passes if St. Louis City and St. Louis County pass it. Um, that's not legal from, from my understanding as well because it's, uh, you run into equal protection issues there. You're saying that the votes in one part of the state in, in, in an election count more than other. Um, and uh, apparently you can't limit how you amend the Constitution. So the other thing that you talked about is having subsequent votes. And, you know, I mentioned that this was not an ideal scenario, and I think it's, it's fair to recognize that. I think the other scenario and, and what we've learned and heard is that the status quo and continuing the status quo is less ideal. We recognize and we saw that what we have in these communities and what we've continued to see in a post-dispatch story as recently as a couple weeks ago is that people are continuing to be abused by the system. Um, people's lives are being changed in really negative ways by what we have today, and we need to address this. It's already taken us five years to get to this point. Um, it's another two years before we have a vote on it, and I think we need to start changing who we are in St. Louis, both to, so that those people can see some relief, but also so that, so that we can start changing the story of what St. Louis is and who we want to be when we move forward. Briefly, I, I want to be, get to those other folks. I respect, Very briefly, every, I respect please. everything you just said, but I, I did want to reiterate that with a couple of those options, you would be able to ensure that not only you get the change that you deserve and are trying for, but it did have the support of the people. Yes, so. So, the, so there is a way to do it. We may disagree on, on the timing, but I just wanted to point out that there is a way to do it. So that's the other thing that I'm, I'm glad you actually followed up, because one of the things that we recognize is something that you said as well, um, that it is not really a it doesn't start off a good government or new government if the people that live here don't support it. And so we're going to be dedicating a lot of resources to making sure folks here understand what this is, understand what it means for their lives, and that there is support. We feel confident that we can win in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. Um, and so I think that the notion that that isn't the case is, is one that's not true as, as well. My name is Terry Franks, and I live here in Calverton Park. But um, what I was going to say is that Personally, nothing has changed since Mike Brown and all the protesting. In my opinion, the government hasn't changed. The police has, have not changed. To me, it's, it's still a very negative situation. Um, but what I wanted to ask is, who will make sure that there is accountability with the police department and making sure that they are a professional police department and making sure that the government and all these attorneys out here that are taking people's money, um, who's going to be holding all these people accountable? Thank you for that question. For this new government. Yes. This new government. So I, I, I think that's a really critical and important point because one of the things that is abundantly clear to us as we went through this process is that even with a structural change that allows us to seek the kinds of reform that we're looking for, none of this is automatic. If you uh, have read the report, the full report uh, that we issued sort of laying out the initial parts of this plan, uh, one of the things that was mentioned there towards the end was the fact that it's still going to take the citizens with a watchful eye to be able to say, this is what we demand from our government and, and working towards those kinds of changes and that kind of accountability, particularly around policing and courts, because we know that simply combining uh, things is not the only thing that needs to happen. 
One of the things that we knew when we understood that the pathway forward uh, uh, for the, this particular proposal was through a statewide vote is that we wanted to keep the question about what people outside this region were asking as narrow as possible. So what this plan is, is it is a new structure for governance. It is not a policy document. It does not say we want to have police, uh, the hiring for police look like this, or we want to have the housing policy in the region look like this. And that work absolutely needs to happen. And so I think one of the things you will see in the future, in the hopefully not too distant future, is a very public uh, process for engaging people around what those decisions look like uh, and ensuring that the leaders of this new government are active in listening to what the community wants uh, from their new government as well. Hello, my name is Patrick Fox. I live in University City. Uh, currently, there are nine components of county sales tax that apply to all of St. Louis County, excluding special taxing districts and TIFs. This includes various funds dedicated to public safety, parks, transportation, emergency communications, and community children's service funds. Would the tax revenue structure currently in place for these funds only remain in the newly defined municipal districts that had previously been St. Louis County? If they remain, would any limitation on where those funds may be used remain intact for the current boundaries of St. Louis County? I think I understand what you're saying. In, in other words, if the boundary of the tax revenue is limited to the prior boundaries of St. Louis County, would those funds only be permitted to be expended within those prior boundaries? If it is explicit that the tax is set up that way, uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, so, and that's something that happens initially. The way the landscape of uh, sales tax in particular and, and all the taxes is actually the same on day one of this new government as it is today. Those things go all, they then, the difference is they become taxes of the metro city and redistributed out to the municipal districts um, rather than the current county, et cetera. So there's an opportunity down the line for the metro council to change some of that, but this amendment does not change that initially. If some of those taxes were only created by vote, would it then require a vote of the newly created municipal district or the metropolitan city? I don't know the right answer to that right now. Can I want to ask one of my organizers to get the question so that I can get back to you because I, I want to give you a good answer. I just I, just, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Thank you. This one comes from St. Louis County. How would our yearly personal property taxes be affected by the merger? They would not be. You want to go to the next one since that one's quickly. Sure. Okay, uh, Mayor Cruson has notified all employees with the St. Louis City that they will keep their jobs, salary, benefits, and pensions with the new city. County Executive Steve Stanger has also notified St. Louis County employees that they will keep their jobs as well. If the plan is supposed to consolidate services to save money, I guess that means that all of the mun municipal employees will be losing their jobs. What guarantees do municipal employees have? How can the mayor and the county executive already decide who gets to keep their job before the new city is actually formed? So the municipal employees, first and foremost, don't lose their jobs unless the municipal district makes a decision about, to change the way that they do business there locally. The, the current municipalities that become municipal districts. So the, the, the leadership of Okay, a couple things. I just ask that we be respectful. Um, number two, if we, I heard specifically about the court employees, uh, that would be a function of the municipal, the metro city after this, and so they would become employees of the metro city. Uh, if you have questions or further things about that, please get in line. Um, I, I, I think one of the important things for the, the big picture of this is, and what I, one of the things I heard in that question is, how do you achieve savings if people aren't gonna be laid off? Uh, it's important to note that the current attrition rate for our local governments is really high. We have a hard time keeping things at our current staffing levels. In the city of St. Louis, I think it's like a 13% attrition rate over the last, they've averaged over the last five years, and it's something not quite that high, but similar at St. Louis County government. And so when the mayor and the county executive talk about that, that's what they're looking at. They, they strongly believe that there are ways to achieve the savings that we know are possible 
through natural attrition rather than layoffs. Um, there may be buyouts or something like that, but I, w there's nothing here that's going to leave folks out in the lurch. So with that, John. First off, I wanted to say that I um, know that you all put a lot of thought into this and it's a very complex procedure to try to imagine and implement. So uh, I want to say that I respectfully disagree with uh, several key facets of this proposal. And primarily what I wanted to point out is that um, I think in many ways it's undemocratic. So we've talked already about the you know statewide vote and I'll pass over that one, but there are some other parts of it that concern me greatly. So for instance, the two mayors during the transition period can essentially rewrite the charter and create the structure of city you know, government, what departments they'll have and all that. And you said that it went to a vote of the new Metro City Council. But the way I understand that vote is that the plan that the mayors come up with goes into effect automatically unless two thirds of the council votes against it. That's a pretty high bar. So basically you're allowing two people to re rewrite the charter for the new Metro City. And that's a long way from the kind of you know, popular votes that we have for charter amendments now. That's, um, uh, I'll just go through a quick list and, let, and then you can answer. Um, the second thing is that Steve Stanger gets to appoint the new uh, Metro City Councilor who then rewrites all the ordinances. And I can imagine that being, you know, a stack of paper like this. Um, then that plan goes to the Metro Council who, um, it's a little vague, but my understanding would be that they have to vote that up, up or down. So they don't get to pick and choose. So I worked for 15, you know, it becomes personal for me. I worked for 15 years for police accountability in the city to get a civilian oversight board. That ordinance could just evaporate because Steve Stinger's guy doesn't like civilian oversight. Um, I, I don't see that as a very democratic process. Um, and finally, the biggest issue for me has to do with minority representation. So with smaller governments now, we have um, parts of the region that are majority minority and folks are able to govern themselves in those systems. So for instance, in the city of St. Louis, where it's roughly 50-50, there are nine citywide elected officials. Seven of those are black. They would all disappear. All that black um, power would disappear under this proposal. And so I can't see how taking those minority populations and diluting their power by putting them into a largely white county, how that um, maintains the um, minority representation that we have now and which I think is really crucial. Okay, so there's really, there's three things there you mentioned. Uh, the first, can you remind me what the first was? The, uh, the um, mayor's rewriting the charter. Right, so okay. So that's actually a little bit of a misnomer. What they are submitting is a reorganization plan for just the executive piece of how the departments are structured uh, for this new government. So it's not like they have carte blanche to say, this is how the county and metro council is going to work and things like that. I need to verify. I can't, I'm not sure that the, it does. I know that it goes to a vote for, for the metro council. I'd need to verify the two thirds because I think that is about other future changes, not about that initial reorganization plan. Um, the second was the rewriting of the ordinances by the right. Appointed, so, appointed right. So the Metro Council. So the way that that is, is going to work is their job isn't going to be rewriting the ordinances. It's going to be examining all the ordinances to understand where there are conflicts and then making a recommendation to the Metro Council on how to resolve those conflicts. And so that's that's that piece. And do they have to vote that up or down on a one vote? They can't pick or choose those ordinances. I I don't know the answer to that, so I will, I'll find out. And thirdly, the question of minority representation. Yes, the minority representation. So one of the things I think, I think that's a really critical uh, consideration. It's one that the task force gave a tremendous amount of time and, and effort into thinking about how best to both preserve but enhance where, where we are from where we, where we be from where we are today. One of the things we, we know about what we have today is we have these seven citywide elected officials in a structure that, quite frankly, is not yielded dividends for uh, many folks in the black community. And so it's one thing to have representation on paper. It's another thing to have the resource to implement policies that might 
positively affect a particular community. And so uh, that was one of the considerations in this. The other part of it is just looking at it from a raw number standpoint. If we're thinking about representation of African Americans in the region uh, purely, we know that there are actually more African Americans that live in St. Louis County than they do in St. Louis City. And so this is in some ways increases representation for some in the region. So I, I, I suppose my response is that I, I don't believe that that is actually going to be the case as far as diluting politi black political power and, and those things were thought through um, pretty clearly on uh, a lot of decisions, whether it be about having at-large districts or having partisan versus nonpartisan elections. We really did the research to understand what the impacts would be on those issues and how they might affect certain communities and, and try to make the decisions that would most uh, empower uh, minority communities, whether it be African Americans or, or any other. Uh, I'm Matthew Sims. I'm a city resident. Um, this isn't the first time that there's been attempts at merging the city and county, and I think it might be the fifth or sixth time if I'm keeping keep my history accurate. Um, what's different about this that this is likely to succeed where it hasn't before? What's different about this? So there have been attempts to um, reorganize the structure of government in St. Louis City and County in the past. Uh, the last one that went to a vote of the people was in 1962. So there were several attempts in the early, the first half of the 20th century and a couple right around the middle of the century, uh, of last century. I think what's different about this versus those efforts is, is two things. One is the amount of research and, and involvement we've tried to have from the community in shaping what these recommendations look like. And two, I, I think we as a region are at a different place than we were the last time we took this up. We know, we've, as I mentioned in the presentation, we've continued to see population decline. We've seen our stature on the world stage continue to decline. We've seen issues around our systems uh, of public safety come to the light that we know have been practices that have happened for, for decades. But once we now have a clear understanding of what those practices are, I think we have an obligation to change it and do something about it. And so. Uh, that combination of factors to me makes this a little bit different and gives me some hope. Yes, sir. Reverend Phil Duvall, Missionary Baptist State Convention, Social Justice Chair. Uh, I think you've already answered some of the questions prior to me taking the mic. I guess I want to make note of two issues. One would be all the way up until 2012, the state control the city police department and after many years of what John spoke to fighting to get rid of the police commissioners currently the St. Louis County Police from 1955 and you said early in your presentations that some of the laws that govern us are over 150 years old and that's one of them when it comes to policing it is imperative that better together examine the St. Louis County structure as it starts to take over the policing head, that it's not governed by police commissioners that are appointed by people that we don't necessarily agree with. So I think it would be a step backwards if we keep the police commissioners as is relative to criminal justice reform and policing the community. The, the other one, real quick, is the court system. Historically, St. Louis City and St. Louis County historically have elected two criminal justice reform prosecutors. It is overload, cash bail system overload that is putting so many people in the jails of capacity and hurting the public. Those are stated, documented facts. In the event that you're merging both courts, that is problematic when both of them, Kim Gardner has just been fighting to get her system up to catch up with the 21st century. And Wesley Bell is currently on record asking the county council for additional money to hold the capacity. Those are major issues that need to be discussed early before 2020. Thank you for that. Um, so the first question, you, you talked about the structure of the management of the police department and the board of police commissioners in St. Louis County. I think that's really critical to understand that part of that reorganization plan, there's an opportunity there to 
have the public input on those changes and there are explicit requirements to engage the public uh, in developing that reorganization plan because there's a real clear opportunity there to change some of those things. And if the folks who are leading this transition are listening, and there will be opportunities to continue to, to drive that point home and make sure that their recommendations reflect the, the desires of the community at large. So that's number one. To your second point, I think similar on, on a similar basis, uh, as I mentioned a, a few moments ago, there's a clear recognition from us of the limitations on developing a structure and what that looks like versus what policy looks like. But there is an absolute need to have good policy be a part of this new government as well. And so I would say stay tuned as far as how we can engage in, in ensuring that those policy recommendations from the community become enacted by this new government. So my closing statement is this. If it's any way possible, no, I didn't say possible. If currently that that's the structure of getting people on there to talk policy, you need to include the people and not these hand-selected people that are driving this policy. I agree. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Harold Whitaker. Uh, you, uh, I've come here the, tonight to learn, to listen, to be open-minded. I do really know that we cannot continue in the status quo, that changes need to be made. And because of that, my question was kind of touched upon first with the question from one of the written questions concerning the uh, employees for the city and, and for the county, but you didn't touch upon the fact of the pensions. Those who are retirees, Will their pensions change, be eliminated, or what? I apologize, I missed that part. The pensions will stay as they are today for all current employees. That's not gonna be affected. Um, and that's in the Constitution pretty clearly as well, that those benefits remain. I think in the future, the Metro government may decide that they want to do something different with their employees moving forward. But for everyone that's currently in the pension system or everyone's currently in the system to collect a pension in the future, that piece is going to stay the same for those folks. Okay, my last question uh, concerning facts as I'm a small business owner. Uh, and you, you, had, you touched upon the uh, streamlining the way of licensing, those type of things. Can you be more specific because it's cumbersome to try to get uh, things done through the, uh, through, these, uh, through, the board, through these processes? So currently the way things work is that there are 90 different processes for licensing a business. Some of them are similar, but it's different based on what municipality you go to. And for some small business owners that's, or business of any size, that's not really a huge problem. But for others, uh, particularly folks that work in, across the region, uh, have a, mobile, a business that has a mobile nature, like an HVAC person, they're either facing the idea of having to get business licenses in every city that they are servicing clients or uh, just going about their business and hoping that they don't get caught violating the current structure. So w I think what we mean by streamlining is having a single process that works across the region and having one that is easier to do business and, and change the business climate a little bit for, for those folks so that we're not having the local governments be an impediment to, um, to growing. I, we have time for, I think, two more questions. And then s stay tuned because I there's, yeah. My name is Gail Woods. Um, I, I'm a resident of Black Jack, Missouri. And I believe I heard you say that the consulting company did a study over some nearby states with their demographics. And I was wondering if they studied our educational de demographics and how they may be alike because I think that is a big portion of some of the problems with crime in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. But in your pamphlet, I see nothing about education. So I'd like you to address that. That's my first question. Um, also, um, you mentioned that people are leaving St. Louis City and County. Well, jobs are leaving St. Louis City and County. I just saw a report about the riverfront how the businesses have just, they're gone because of Ballpark Village. So if there's no jobs, people have to go to where the jobs are. Did your study look at that? We did not get the Amazon uh, business that we were hoping to get. 
So there's a lot of things that this brochure is not covering that what your study examined. So I would like that to be addressed. What did the study examine as far as how does St. Louis hold up with the surrounding states? So we didn't, as I mentioned before, we didn't uh, look at education. Um, so I don't know, we don't have any statistics about that. Um, to your second point about the jobs leaving the region, I think you're absolutely right. We do have jobs leaving the region and that's part of the problem. Um, what we have is a system that just really makes it difficult for people to operate. I think if you're a company like Amazon looking at a region like St. Louis and doing business, uh, you see the landscape and understand that it's going to be exceedingly difficult compared to other regions to actually operate and get going here. And so you're automatically turned off. We know of specific examples of opportunities that have passed us by in this region, whether it be from sports opportunities like the Ironman competition that looked and couldn't get compliance on what they needed for security for their event, or when Google Fiber was first starting over 10 years ago, they looked at St. Louis and the, the work that would be required to get the necessary permits and licensing across all these different businesses and said that it was sort of a no, a, a no deal for them. So I think that's part of the impetus for this change is understanding that we need to do something different to attract economic development in a different way rather than moving the pie around. Thank you. I think education is part of the key and I just don't understand why you don't, your study does not realize that children are part of the future because after we're all gone, it's left up to them. So I cannot understand why education is not a part of the study. So I, I will briefly say, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I did, I know this is a question, I want to be respectful of folks' time, but it's not that we don't think education is important. I don't want to give that impression. That's certainly not true. Um, I think what I would say is that we don't feel that we're the right ones to be leading that conversation. And we also recognize that the well-being of a child is more than just what happens in the classroom. There was recently uh, a report that came out from the city of St. Louis equity indicators where they flagged the, uh, the fact that in St. Louis city, th we have a, on, in child well-being, we had a score of 25.75, which essentially what they did was they looked at what are the factors that determine the well-being of a child, how well they can do in the classroom, the factors outside the classroom, what do those things look like? and how are we doing in delivering those services. That 25.5 is what we scored on a, on a 100. The St. Louis County is still in the process of doing their study, but I, I gotta tell you, um, it, it's not gonna be a much rosier picture when we take the whole region into account. And so we know that, yes, education is critical. We are not the ones who should be leading that conversation because we haven't done the work on it. Uh, but there are pieces of this, the local government picture and how we deliver human services across the region that can be enhanced by making sure we're doing it in a directed and concerted way across the region that will have a positive impact on kids. Last couple of questions here. Um, I have many questions, I was gonna ask two. Can okay. I refer one to the young lady behind me? Thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Chris Silliman. I'm a uh, unincorporated North County resident, have been forever. I'm a detective with the Maryland Heights Police Department, been there 20 years. Um, my, one of my questions was gonna be, in Maryland Heights, we have a very good reputation. We have a very good response time to emergency and non-emergency calls, usually within five minutes. As an unincorporated North County resident who gets patrolled by St. Louis County Police, it will take 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes for an officer to show up to my house or my, my neighbor's house. Can you guarantee the people of Maryland Heights, Bridgeton, St. Anne, and Creep Corps, County Country, that they're not gonna lose their quick response times with a consolidated police department? I think you, <laughs> so you're, you're taking my pause as a, as a confirmation of something that's not true. I, I don't think that that's the case. First of all, I would say a couple things. One, as I understand it, I'm obviously not a law enforcement professional, you are, but response time is one indicator of um, police performance that among many, and when we think about when a crime is committed, the true nature of response time and the importance of it to a specific crime is not, and, and it's actually solving that crime is, is sort of outweighed because we know that in an emergency situation, we want to have someone there and we want to have them now. 
So I, I would highlight that as, as one part of the puzzle. The other part is that while the folks in Maryland Heights have, uh, from what you describe, exceptional service in, in some other parts of the region, we know that it is far, far less adequate in other parts of the region. And to me, that is an injustice that we can't continue to perpetrate. And so we need to have a unified approach to bring up that standard across the board so that the people in where you live now can have the things that, that you describe having in your professional life. My name is Wanda Lane. I am a citizen. I live in Bell Fountain Neighbors, Missouri. Uh, a, couple of, a couple of observations. Number one, when I've tried to have this conversation with my neighbors and or elected officials, the immediate response is no. And I was quite um, disappointed that to learn that most of the people that I speak to have not even read the plan. Most of the people that I speak to have already formed an opinion against the plan before it was even published. So my question is, I, I've, I've read it, and I've heard about all of the ways that you've reached out to the community. Um, I saw a public um, a session on Facebook about with some African-American uh, clergy and most of them said no. Some of my elected officials in my area said no. So my question is this, what do you plan to do to help market this plan a little better where people understand it? The first things I hear is how much power we're going to lose and they're going to take away our power and they're going to do that. I just think that people don't fully understand it, and that's one of the reasons why you're getting the pushback from it. Yeah. So what are your plans on that? So I think your assessment is right. People don't understand it. And so meetings like this is our first uh, foray into that. Obviously, there's a lot of information to be processed in this, it's sort of like drinking from a fire hose. And we want to offer as many opportunities as possible for people to come and hear directly from our organization. Uh, the, the young man standing behind you and some of the other folks in the room here were hired to help spread that message on an individual basis. I, I swear we didn't plant this. I've, I've never met you. I thank you no, for coming, but you transitioned perfectly into our, our next segment. All right. <laughs> um, so obviously this conversation can't end tonight. Um, it shouldn't. We have a lot of, a lot more discussion to have, a lot more questions to be answered. We need to make sure that as many people as possible have the opportunity to hear what this is, what this is not, and how it might impact their life and their community. Because as I, as I mentioned before, um, it's not a great idea to have, well, so what's next for us is continue to share your experience and share your questions. Obviously, we were able to answer uh, several questions here tonight, but there may be questions. We know that there are some that weren't answered. We asked these folks to fill out cards. Uh, we, you may have a question on the way home tonight that you want to have answered. Go to our website, bettertogetherstl.com backslash ask. There's a new portal there that both has some frequently asked questions, the answers to those uh, that's searchable. Uh, we also have an opportunity for you to submit a question and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, we really try to make sure that we get back to people on the questions because we recognize that if people have doubts about what the substance of this is, they're certainly not gonna be supportive of something and that can't be the case. We are working to dedicate tremendous resources to making sure people in all parts of this region do have the opportunity to have this conversation, whether it's in settings like this or for folks who want to host a meeting or a presentation at a group that they're already a part of. We've to date already received over 116 requests to come and speak to different community groups. Uh, I anticipate after tonight we'll have some more. If you have a group that you'd like us to come speak to, please go to our website and sign up and we'll have someone there to come and answer your questions. If you just want to host a house party at your house, you have 10, 15 folks from your neighborhood or in your network that you want to have, please, we welcome that opportunity as well. Because we really recognize that this is a lot to process. This is a big conversation. Uh, we think it's long overdue, but we're just at the beginning of it. And so we hope that you'll continue to engage us and continue to uh, be with us as we try to work through this as a community. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all for your time. I, we ran five minutes over, but I think hopefully you're understanding and have a